From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Former Vice President Mike Pence says it's time for choosing for Republicans and that conservatism and a populism unmoored to conservative principles are incompatible. And he challenges his former boss, Donald Trump, on the point. Plus, Bernie Sanders has become Joe Biden's biggest cheerleader in the presidential race. What behind the Vermont socialist enthusiasm? And Mitch McConnell, Republican leader, says he's sticking around as leader, <clears throat> despite two episodes in which he froze before the cameras. Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo with the Wall Street Journal opinion page. And I'm here with my colleagues and political analysts extraordinaire, Kyle Peterson and Kim Strasso. Welcome to you both. Former Vice President Mike Pence gave a speech this week, which he clearly considers to be a major theme of his presidential candidacy. He really wants to make this uh, demarcation between himself as a traditional conservative and some of the other candidates who he describes as populists, essentially without conservative principle. Let's listen to him talk about it. I submit to you, if we abandon that trust and that confidence in the American people, if we cease to be champions of our Constitution and all the principles enshrined in it, our party's relevancy will be confined to the history books. It may live on in some populist fashion, but then it will truly be, in a cruel twist, Republican in name only. When Donald Trump ran for president in 2016, he promised to govern as a conservative. And together we did. But it's important for Republicans to know that he and his imitators in this Republican primary make no such promise today. It seems like they forget that we succeeded because of a conservative agenda, not in spite of it. I mean, the truth is Donald Trump, along with his imitators, often sound like an echo of the progressives they seek to replace. Tough stuff. Turning Republicans in name only on its head, that's, the, of course, the accusation that Trump makes about other Republicans who don't agree with him, despite his break from what has been traditional Republican policy orthodoxy, and an echo of progressives. Kyle, what do you, what do you make of Mike Pence's um, foray here? Well, I think he's right on some of the policy merits. I think that he is right on trying to take the Republican Party back toward a Reaganite foreign policy in opposition to some of the other people on the debate stage like Vivek Ramaswamy, who is talking about essentially ceding Asia to China and ceding Eastern Europe to Russia. I think he's right to oppose some of the industrial policy that is in flavor in some of the Republican Party. I think that there are a couple problems, though. One of those is that he is talking about a rising populism within the Republican Party. And don't forget that that populism did a hostile takeover, essentially, of the Republican Party in 2016. And Mike Pence was along for the ride. So part of what I think he's trying to do here is draw some contrasts and maybe set up a little bit of a legacy for himself as someone who fought the good fight. But he may be at risk of picking a losing fight. I mean, if you look at the Republican polling, he is at just under 5% in the national average at Real Clear Politics. In Iowa, he's at just under 4%. And so the problem that he has, I think, is he is setting this up with a Reagan line that there is a time for choosing in the Republican Party. But it calls to mind another Reagan line, at least for me, which is that I didn't leave my party, my party left me. Of course, the time for choosing line is an echo of uh, Ronald Reagan's famous speech in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken about the timing for that. Kim, I mean, uh, Kyle's drawing a distinction here between the message and the messenger. He basically is saying, I think, and I'm not taking him in vain here, I hope that part of the problem here is Mike Pence is not the best messenger for this theme because of his tenure under Donald Trump. Or is the problem that the party, as Kyle also suggests, is no longer where it was 10, 15 years ago on so many of these issues, in part because of the intervention of Trump and so you don't have a party which is any more robust on foreign policy. It's more isolation. A second, it doesn't believe in free markets anymore. It's really becoming a big government party, doesn't want to touch social security entitlements, uh, believes in industrial policy. It's no longer really even socially conservative because Donald Trump, of course, is soft selling the opposition to abortion. What do you think? 
It's a little bit of both. I mean, I agree with Kyle that Pence has an issue here trying to disassociate himself with his close tie to Trump over those four years where he was really lead surrogate for the administration. His argument in that speech, and you heard that clip, was, well, he's changed. But the reality is, is the things that most define Donald Trump's populism, as it were, were definitely all present, even as Mike Pence signed up for that job at the time. I think he's, Donald Trump has certainly leaned in on that even more. One of the things I think is notable here, there wasn't much that I disagreed with in that Pence speech other than his use of the term populism. I, I think populism sometimes, you know, it gets a, a bad name in certain situations, you know, having a country that is unified behind certain ideals can be beneficial. Sometimes, you know, populism can bring people back into a conversation. The problem is when it goes off the rails and politicians use it instead to pander, to stoke division, to pit groups against each other. And and Pence got into this a little bit. He did say that the problem in his mind with Trumpian politics was it was the politics of personal grievance and performative outrage which is along the lines of what I am trying to say here. And so I think that was always present to a degree in Trumpism and how he removes himself from those years he was with him is hard. He's also right that there has been a drift in the party. I do not think that it's taken an entire hold yet. I think that there's a risk of it and that that is uh, of it. It's certainly the party very much moving in a different direction without certain leaders who do try to pull it back to the tried and true formula that is more Reagan-esque. You know, we'll see how that goes. I think this was why, you know, Pence gave the speech warning about that possibility, although in some ways it, it might also still be a little overstated. I think one of the ironies here is that to the degree to which the Trump administration was a policy success, and I think they did have many successes, tax reform, for example, deregulation, judicial nominees, and the revolution in the courts. Those were all very traditional Republican conservative ideas. I mean, they've been around for decades. School choice, for example, promoting that. That's not a break from orthodoxy. I would argue that the things that were less successful from a policy point of view were some of these so-called populist issues. And I say that in particular about some of Trump's foreign policy issues took uh, on trade, for example, did not, I think, succeed and even on its own terms in changing the U.S. trade deficit much, certainly did focus people in a way they hadn't on some of China's violations. But the tariffs didn't change China's behavior very much at all. And uh, I think there's also the sense that, Kyle, on immigration, yes, Donald Trump did, I think, control the border more. He didn't build that border wall. And as soon as Biden came in, you know, he could change that policy in an instant. Right. So one of the arguments that is circulating in the Republican primary is whether we just need someone who has Donald Trump's views but knows how to work the levers of government a little bit better than Trump himself did, someone who is more focused and has a longer attention span than Trump did. That is sort of the argument you are hearing from Ron DeSantis as opposed to what Pence and some others are saying, which is that we need to get back to a more traditional Reaganite policy. I agree with you on the tariff specifically. I think there is a sense of underrating the collateral damage that that has done. The taxpayer money that was spent to bail out farmers after trading partners retaliated against U.S. exports. Tens of billions of dollars. Right. And then this whole exclusion process whereby if you're a U.S. company and you needed some sort of foreign part or foreign material to make your own product, and you were suddenly made uncompetitive by the tariffs, you had to go to the Commerce Department and beg some bureaucrat for a tariff exclusion. I think that is real political interference in the economy that traditional conservatives would have broadly opposed. And remember, Trump is now threatening to quintuple down on that basically in a second term by imposing a universal 10% tariff on anything imported to the United States. I think there are many people in the Republican Party, though, who are sort of fair weather populists. And the putative leader of the party since 2016 has been Trump. He is leading in the polls. 
And so they feel a need to cater to that sort of view and try to not get too sideways with President Trump in fear of a truth social post or something like that. But I don't know how deep those views goes. And and that's been part of the problem, for example, with Ron DeSantis, is he has been a traditional conservative. He was a guy in the House who voted, for example, for the Ryan budgets, as as Trump continues to say. And so how seriously do you take his his populist forays now? And Kim, who is uh, who is Mike Pence talking about here other than Donald Trump? I guess Vivek Ramaswamy, for one. To some extent, maybe trying to draw a distinction on uh, with Ron DeSantis on foreign policy in particular. And yet, Ron DeSantis has populist rhetorical overtones, but so many of his policies are basically fundamentally conservative. I would also, just to reinforce the point you made earlier, Kim, about defining populism versus conservatism, I think it can be overdrawn as two differing schools of politics because populism ultimately means what? something that is popular. <laughs> and you know, Ronald Reagan was in that sense a populist. And every successful president is in some sense a populist because you have to sell your ideals to the people. So any successful presidential candidate is going to be in some sense a populist. I think the way the definition is taken on in some circles is that Trump defines what is populism on the right. And you know, I'm not so sure that's, that's correct. Right. And I think what we're witnessing here, my own view of this, is that we're witnessing some in the Republican Party who are misreading Donald Trump's popular appeal with people. I think some of this comes from 2016. And obviously what we all know from in the aftermath of that election was that one thing Donald Trump did do is get a lot of white working class Americans to vote for him. Some who had uh, sat out some elections and came back, some who uh, simply decided as a block they were going to go with him. And there's been endless analysis about this and almost an obsession in both parties about, well, how do you get the working class vote in the country? And I think that's inspired some of these other politicians that you see, Vivek Ramaswamy, you noted, I think it it helps explain uh, Ron DeSantis and some of his, uh, you know, playing around with some of this populist rhetoric, even though I agree that his policies don't really fall into that. The thing that makes me laugh is work living myself in a, a working class community. What people are attracted to in Donald Trump is really is his kind of performance art. They're not really listening often to a lot of the policies. Uh, just a, an amusing anecdote. I had a was sitting around with some people, all of them blue collar workers, and one of them had recently heard something that Marco Rubio had said. And obviously, Marco Rubio has also taken a big turn toward national conservatism. And this person had heard him talking about the need for the federal government to engage more and set industrial policy and vastly expanded child tax credit. And this guy, who, by the way, is a Trump voter, was like, what happened to Marco Rubio? He's insane. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's my point, is that I think a lot of people who actually vote for Trump, it's so much more about him. It's about his personality and his willingness to go places where others won't and uh, the fact that he they feel that he's been targeted unfairly. But I think, unfortunately, there are politicians on the right who have misread that appeal and are going down, kind of doubling down on some of his worst policy instincts, thinking that that is what gets them support. Well, I'm glad Mike Pence is floating some of this debate because I think it's a debate the party needs to have regardless of how you frame it, especially when it comes to the market economy and foreign policy. 